Cool. So uh, nice to be here this morning. Uh, ben and I, as Brady mentioned, kind of founded Ajaxian.com. We now have a new site called Function Source uh, that we'll kind of talk about a little bit. And uh, we run kind of the mobile side of, of Walmart Labs. And so we're trying to do the, just as, as the, the NASA chap there was talking about trying to do the Silicon Valley thing in space, we're trying to do it in a, a rather large company like Walmart. So uh, as we get started, uh, talking about perspectives on the web versus apps, as Brady mentioned in the intro, we wanted to see if you guys could tell us who's responsible for three quotes. So we're going to show three of them here and uh, just let us know what company said these things. So the first one with HTML5, you can make as rich an experience as an app. HTML5 is a beautiful thing. You get lost in the experience and you forget that you're on the web. And HTML5 makes desktop operating systems obsolete. You, you no longer need to worry about a Windows app or a Mac app or it's just use HTML5. So uh, what company do you think said these things? Apple. I heard Apple over here. Microsoft. Any other guesses? Walmart. Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Not Walmart. Um, <laughs> so uh, I didn't mean that in a negative. Yeah. Um, so it turns out that Microsoft is the right answer. And for us, when we heard this thing at, at their uh, recent launch event uh, for IE9 beta, the fanciest beta launch event I think we've ever been to. Yeah, and it was around the corner from here. It was actually right next to the Adobe building, I think is a little bit of a kind of a subtle hint. They put on this massive event for this. It wasn't even the final release of IE9. And for us, you know, we've worked at Mozilla, Google, big web guys. To kind of hear Microsoft come out and say this was a little bit puzzling. It was very puzzling, except they didn't actually say this quote. We, we made this one up. They didn't, they didn't say that. But the others <laughs> they did say. And uh, it was really shocking. Um, and the entire event was just bizarre. Uh, it was really high production value. And they'd chartered all of these rich web applications to show off what the web can do. And it was ironic that they were so close to Adobe because they looked like they used the same agencies that did Flash apps before the event. <laughs> um, but they, they showcased um, how the web could be this really, really rich experience in the native apps. You don't even need to worry about those native apps. And you know, we mentioned that we made this quote up, but in fact, they said something remarkably similar to this just a few months later when they launched Windows 8. And they came out and said, you actually don't need to create native Windows apps anymore. You can just use the web. And so, Again, why would Microsoft you know, give a bear hug to the web so intensely when their playbook up until now had been really quite different? Um, their playbook had been all about suffocating the web and mitigating its power or its, or its potential. And they had a great strategy for doing that, from reducing the value of the browser to zero or taking web applications and actually chaining them to a particular operating system. And uh, in the last instance here with WPF, in increasing the expectations that users have for native applications to try and create a delta so that users would no longer be satisfied interacting with the web. And so they really tried to, to mitigate the web. Right. And we, again, we come from the browser side, so we always think about, you know, what's going on here? How are they coming back? Is this because Chrome's taken off and like Firefox is going? Why are they doing this? But then we kind of took another look back at, at the playbook that Ben was talking about and, you know, what was going on in the desktop era? Um, that Microsoft kind of learned from and kind of like built their lead off of. That's right, because when you look in that desktop here, you realize that the web liberated all of us. Uh, if you go back, it's a, it's a time that sort of smacks very similar to the time that we're in now, because you had all these platforms. This is just a subset of the platforms, including that obscure one in the middle. Does anyone know what that is, that black computer in the middle? Any ideas? The NASA guy, surely. He's English. Sinclair Spectrum, there yeah, we go. It's that, it's that old British computer. Rubber keyboard, it was awesome. You could clean it, it was great. The Atari, the Atari 400 was much better. No, they should have sent that to space. <laughs> the Atari 400, they? <laughs> so um, there's all these platforms that were competing, and if, you were, if you've been in the industry in this era, you remember the sort of the vibrant competition until at one point, one of the players created an app advantage. They ran away and they had all the momentum, and the other platforms were left out in the cold. And even when arguably, well, not arguably, objectively more uh, innovative and interesting products came to market, because they didn't have the apps, they were locked out. Um, and it really remained like this, which in a sense was OK, right? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you take a platform like this and you kind of run away in a lead, obviously you're going to keep fighting. You're going to keep innovating for your customer. You're going to make the best possible product for them. And that's what happened. <laughs> But, but really, we were stuck in this, in this mode until the web came along. Because the web is really what enabled us to get to the properties that mattered in this era. And so it didn't matter what operating system you were on, all of a sudden, you can actually get to what you wanted to get to, even if you were on these sort of smaller share platforms. 
Um, and so it was really sort of liberating the impact that it had on all of us. Yeah, and like you think about when this happened, at this time, it was so exciting that I could go to Google and different search engines and search all of the information that's out there. I could connect to friends on the different side of the world in kind of a new and different ways. And this desktop experience of you know, focus on productivity and office and the like seemed just like really boring. And it feels like we've had kind of a similar thing in mobile, where now I've got this thing in my hand and I can do all these things and it's context aware feels like we're kind of repeating the revolution. That's right. And so when Microsoft comes out and embraces the web the way that they have, they're really repeating the history that Apple did when they introduced the iMac. When Steve came back to Apple, what was, the, what was his strategy? It wasn't to say that, hey, Mac apps are just amazingly superior to Windows and, and the world's just better on the Mac. You should just come and get our great apps. He recognized that the internet was this gateway and he said, you know, if you go back and look at the iMac collateral, it was all about how the Mac is the best way to get to the internet. It's the fastest way to get to the internet. And that's why they have the I in front of all the products. It was internet. Um, and they, they leveraged the internet as a way to break through the app hegemony that had been, that had been created. Um, and so we mentioned history repeating. If you look at what's happening right now, clearly mobile is where, is where all the innovation's happening. If you look at the engagement that people have with apps right now on mobile platforms, it's tremendous. And the apps in the ecosystem are all of these really high quality, amazing Fantastic apps. Fantastic apps. And you want to spend a lot of time with. Just changing the way we live, you know? Well, I, I guess Angry Birds is nice, but there's a lot of. <laughs> well, maybe not all the apps are great, but um, clearly mobile is the future. And desktop, you know, whatever role desktop will have, it will be rolled up through mobile and we'll just have these devices, some of which will be on your desk, some of which you'll carry with you. And mobile represents the future of our industry. And if you go back and ask yourself, if the web played this sort of interesting freeing role for desktop platforms, will that repeat itself? Is the web the platform that's gonna unlock mobile platforms? Because we spent some time at perhaps a losing mobile platform uh, <laughs> when we were at, at Palm. Uh, well, I guess we could pretty much say they lost at this point, right? I think so. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the big reason why that Palm lost and some, so many of the other players lost was apps. They just didn't have any access to get to the apps. Um, and so is the web gonna unlock this and let us have a bunch of different mobile innovation despite um, app monopolies? Right. And it's actually kind of tough, right? Because if you go back and you look at, at the old days, <laughs> how did we get software when the web first came onto the scene? You'd have to go to Akehead Software or another software retailer. Does anyone know who this is in the screen, by the way? Anyone, anyone? Lord Garriott? Anyone? Does that bring <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. Next. All right, we'll move on. Um, but like, you'd have to go to like stores <laughs> <laughs> to buy software, um, whereas the web prevented you with the, presented you with this opportunity where you could just like enter a URL, boom, you were there, and you didn't go have to go through the install step and the buy step. Huge consumer advantage. And at the same time, if you remember what user interfaces were like in the web's heyday, the desktop class applications really weren't all that impressive compared to what we were interacting with on the web. And so the web had these massive consumer advantages, and at the same time, the downsides weren't that great. And now, it's really, quite different, isn't it? I mean, you can discover and install apps all electronically. It's really quite smooth. And uh, the, the interfaces that we can get in native apps in many cases are pretty extraordinary. Yeah, exactly. The whole comparing the UI, it just didn't matter. Again, if you, you know, we're kind of making fun of the desktop back then. If, if we're showing you a screenshot of what Amazon.com looked like, or even you know, Apple.com and Disney.com, uh, those aren't impressive too, but people weren't kind of really thinking in those terms at those times. And so while the web had these interesting consumer advantages that drove its adoption, right now the web's advantages are primarily targeted at us as engineers. The web presents potential efficiencies that we can gain as we use the web as a cross-platform alternative, but the, but the end user advantages aren't there like they used to be. But surely end users will choose the web because they sense the macro opportunity exactly. of unlocking Exactly, as we've learned right? as a species, we always think long term. We're thinking about the best thing to, for us to do for the future. Oh, yum. Mm. <laughs> food, food. <laughs> it's like, as a culture, I mean, obviously users don't think in those terms, right? Like fast food would not exist if we all thought about the long term, right? Occasionally we get hungry, we think, oh, that would taste good right now. <laughs> Uh, we think making bets on platforms based on users choosing the best benefit for the long-term ecosystem is probably not a good strategy. But at the same time, we think the web has an interesting role to play. And so we want to talk about the sphere where the web really has a role to play right now, which is on the technical advantages that it presents to us as developers. Um, and the obvious advantage is to use the web as a cross-platform solution that allows us to go to all these different platforms. But this is an interesting quote um, that I think describes an experience that a lot of us have had as we've tried to do that. And the sum of the quote is basically, 
it's not as easy as that. It's actually somewhat difficult to take the web, which is not optimized for user interfaces that are rich with different components and that doesn't particularly behave like any of the look and feel guidelines on any of the platforms, and to use that for the overall experience can be pretty challenging. But at the same time, there's some real advantages to using the web. Yeah, once you come from a culture that's used to this continuous deployment, this is Etsy talking here, you talk to any of the large web companies, they're deploying once to 30 times a day, and they've built the system that allows, this, allows them to deploy their latest and greatest code out. Users don't have to worry about it. They're not doing installs. They're not thinking about any of that stuff. Once you come from that world, going to an app install model uh, has its pain too. In fact, it's a little more nuanced than this. We want to break it down a little bit and talk about some specific advantages that the web has. Continuous deployment's one of them. But in short, there is some leverage to be had here. You know, we talked about how it's difficult to create a cross-platform experience, but the fact is we do have these browsers and all these different devices, and the capabilities are fairly on par with each other. And we just talked about live distribution, but that's a tremendous advantage to be able to make an update to the app and deploy it instantly. Android doesn't have a review process, but you still got to have the users upgrade the app. Some of the users will never do that. Um, and so the ability to just change that instantly is really compelling. And uh, also the ability to have a different experience uh, for different sets of users. Netflix is one big proponent of this strategy, or is it Quickster? Or Quickster, Quickster, yeah, or Quickster. Or, uh, uh, that's the, no, that's the uh, DVD one. Whatever. Um, but live distribution is another great advantage, the ability to have different experiences for your users. That's a little difficult when you have to plan them in advance and bundle them together, distribute them, and then have some algorithm for figuring out which experience to use all on the client. Um, it's a lot easier on the server side. This one, I think, is huge. This, to me, is kind of why the web is so special. The fact that we've got this amazing loose coupling. And Android has a great intent system that, in some ways, is kind of superior, and there's got more kind of that you can work with there. But in general, having this loose coupling, like we're talking about the web here, there's really the server side and there's the client side. And this allows us to seamlessly integrate between experiences. I don't have to know anything about that experience on the other side, and I can link to it. And I think that's a huge advantage that the web has. Another is just a vibrant ecosystem that's out there. There's just an unrivaled amount of tools and, and utilities and frameworks that meet a variety of different needs for development that pale in comparison when you look at the native platforms. And on a related note is the exciting end-to-end -end stuff that's happening. Yeah, so we've done a lot of work with uh, Node on the back end. Node allows you to take your same JavaScript, run it on the back end, and also run it on the client side. And then when you think about using a database like Mongo, that's JSON all the way down to the data store, you now have this kind of turtles all the, down, all the way down approach where you can take JavaScript and have it work across the entire stack. And you know, we've done a lot of kind of fun uh, experiments, function source itself, uh, uses this ability to kind of take your client code and automatically run it on the server if you've got like low power mobile devices hitting you, for example. So um, the web has clear advantages over what's available in native today. But at the same time, native has pretty strong advantages too, with native GUI toolkits that have interesting capabilities, got some great tools that really, I just talked about how there's this ecosystem, but some of the native <coughs> tools are really incredible. It's the most efficient way to create an app, uh, especially when you look at the NDK on Android. Um, there's no, you don't have to wait for people to expose these APIs to you in some way, you can just get to them. And in a sense, there's no paradox of choice. You don't have to choose from all this big ecosystem of tools. There's one way to do it. So um, the interesting thing for us is that it's not an either or solution. Uh, you don't have to throw away native platforms and go to something. We love PhoneGap, by the way. But we don't think the right answer is to throw out native capabilities and just embrace the web. And at the same time, uh, we have a screenshot here at Netflix. We did a study of it on our site, Function Source, where we talk about how their business really runs effectively by embracing the web. How do we bring these together? We think Facebook is a fantastic example of how to do this. If you look at their, uh, at their strategy, they have a core UI component, the news feed, and that same experience is embedded in the native context and also the web context. But the rest of the native app is great. It uses native capabilities and, and does a lot of great stuff. And on the web, it doesn't try to look like an app. It actually looks like a mobile web page. And it's also a great experience. And you see this in other contexts, too, with LinkedIn, for example. Yeah, LinkedIn, Kieran is actually going to be speaking at the event. Uh, he uses a very similar stack to what we use, uh, Walmart Labs. And you kind of see these different uh, experiences within here. It's very different on iOS uh, to Android and on the mobile website. But when you, you kind of piece it apart, you can kind of see how things uh, are kind of shared. So the Android is on the right. Uh, you got that looking very similar to iPhone. 
Mobile web looks very different. It's not as fancy. It's not trying to do too much. We've actually kind of uh, gone through that cycle uh, ourselves where you get tempted to get these, you know, you've got these great mobile web guys that want to mimic everything like the application experience. But uh, we're actually kind of going a different way. And people that come through your mobile website do things very uh, differently. They're trying to do different things. And so we make the mobile web experience very different from uh, what you have on the native experience, both because the horsepower that you have available, uh, but also people are actually tending to do different things. So we've implemented this strategy ourselves where we have a native shopping cart on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have a checkout that's web implemented. And in fact, on Android, we have the same strategy. And for our Android and iOS applications, we're able to use exactly the same HTML and server-side code, different CSS styling, but the same code base. But the rest of our app is fully native. And so we're able to leverage the web in place, but still take advantage of the advanced capabilities of native platforms. And we do that on the iPad, too. And so to wrap up, a lot of times, we're tempted to look at these stacks as choices. We either choose the web or we choose native stacks, or maybe we do a thin native wrapper. But we think it's really effective to view these stacks as working together, <laughs> looking for opportunities where the web can give us some leverage, not trying to throw out all the advantages of native in, at that same time. And while it's an incremental savings and not a magical silver bullet that gives us all platforms at once, it's the right answer for users. And it gives us real cost savings and helps us choose the best of both worlds. Um, thank you for giving us some time to present to you guys today. We really enjoyed it, and come join us. Thanks.